Hey folks, and welcome back to the video lectures for Philosophy 120, Critical Thinking, where we look at causal inductive arguments today. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at what a causal argument is, what on earth is this thing I have titled the whole video lecture after. We're going to look at the concepts of correlation and causation, look at a few methods of causal reasoning, a specific example called inference to the best explanation, and then, like we often do, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the common errors in causal reasoning. All as we continue this unit, that's all about induction and inductive arguments. So, let's get to it, shall we? Now, before we hit up all the textbook stuff, let's imagine a scenario. Imagine that you are a 19th century Hungarian physician. It's a very specific fantasy to have, I'll admit. But let's imagine for a time that you are such a person, a 19th century Hungarian doctor named Ignaz Semmelweis. Now, if you were such a physician, you might notice in the hospital where you work that there are two different maternity wards, but the two are not the same in many different ways. One ward is run by midwives and has pretty average outcomes overall. There's a number of women that die in childbirth, a number of children that don't survive the process, but overall things are about average for the location and the time period. The other maternity ward, however, is far more grim. The other maternity ward is actually run by doctors rather than the traditional midwife. And so while you might expect that survival rates are up, and as a matter of fact, they're actually much lower than the maternity ward run by midwives. And yet, the doctors are supposed to be so much more well-trained, they have all the modern science and implements and everything else. So, well, so we might wonder, what is it that causes the extra death? What is it that causes this higher mortality rate in the maternity ward? Why are the two not equal? And so, you might do a little bit of digging and observe things for a while. And you notice that the doctors who work in the maternity ward, along with their medical students and interns and everything else, they often go straight from autopsy, where they work on cadavers, dead bodies, and go straight to the maternity ward afterwards. And they don't clean anything from their hands to their instruments or anything. They can go literally within five minutes from handling the insides of a dead body to helping a woman give birth and do so cheerily and without so much as a change of clothes or dampening their hands. And so you get the crazy, crazy idea at the time that if doctors washed their hands in between autopsies and helping women give birth, that they might in fact help reduce the number of deaths that happen. But now you have a question that arises. How do you actually go about showing this type of thing to your fellow doctors? How do you actually establish that hand washing causes a lower mortality rate? That hand washing helps prevent death and disease and infection in your maternity wards? You might simply show them. You might demonstrate the these two things go together, that the doctors who you manage to convince with your long and crazy rants about hygiene, of all things, actually had fewer deaths in their practice. And you might simply show them this way. But that kind of reasoning can be a bit difficult to sell sometimes. In particular, the reasoning that this fellow, Ignaz Semmelweis, the so-called father of hand washing, used was induction. He used an inductive argument to help demonstrate his point. Specifically, he used what's called a causal argument to demonstrate his point. And it's this kind of argument that we're going to spend our time on today digging deeper into. So a causal argument is an inductive argument in which the conclusion, excuse me, claims that one thing causes or prevents another thing. In the historical case, 
Hand washing before helping with a birth reduces mortality. That is, it prevents death or at least it lowers the likelihood of death. It causes a lower mortality rate. Now, this type of argument is probably not one that you're a stranger to. Like with most inductive arguments, it's something that you're probably deeply familiar with already because you use these things every day and to establish all sorts of different conclusions that one thing causes another. But when we actually look at them, causal arguments can actually be a bit difficult to support, not causal arguments, but causal claims. Saying that one thing causes another can be very difficult to prove at times. And so it warrants quite a bit more investigation than we might originally think. And this is in part because when we say that one thing causes another, if we say that X causes Y, we might mean one of several different things. We might mean that X is necessary for Y to happen. It's a necessary condition. Without X, Y won't happen. Or we might mean that X is a sufficient condition for Y. We might mean that given X, Y will occur. Or we might mean that X is both necessary and sufficient for Y to happen. Or we might simply mean that X is a causal factor for Y. That is, that X is relevant in some way to Y happening, or it makes Y more likely in some way. Now, logically speaking, in terms of clear and precise definitions, the first three of these options are the clearest. But the last one is one of the more common that shows up in scientific claims and in scientific studies. And being able to tell the difference between these and building arguments for each of these different specific claims is something that we need to be careful on and something that we need to investigate a little bit more clearly and a little bit more closely. So let's dive into some of the nuances having to do with causal arguments, see some of the things to avoid and some of the ways to construct them well so that we can just be better critical thinkers overall. So one of the first things we're going to have to watch out for when we want to establish that one thing causes another is that we don't mistake correlation for causation. That is, we don't want to mix up two things simply being associated together with causing each other. Remember, this is the kind of thing that Hume worried about as a matter of like philosophy and justification for induction in general. And so we need to be careful that we don't just assume that because two things happen to occur in the same place or they don't occur in the same place, that they either cause or prevent each other. And so we need to be clear on what correlation is and what it does and doesn't tell us. Now, correlation comes in basically in three different flavors, positive correlation, negative correlation, and of course, no correlation. That is no relation between, between two different things. Positive correlation simply means that two things, call them A and B, are commonly associated together. That is, more A's than non-A's are associated with B. The, this means that there's a positive correlation between the two. Say, like, say, going to college and being rich. Unfortunately, probably all of you are far too familiar with the idea that going to college does not make you rich. However, more people who go to college than not end up being rich. You're more likely to be rich if you go to college. So there's a positive correlation, we might say, between going to college and being rich. More people who go than those who don't end up being rich. Now, this is the opposite of a negative correlation, which says that not more non-A's than A's are connected with B or are the same as B. And here we might look at smokers and being healthy. More non-smokers than smokers are healthy. That is, more people who don't smoke are healthy than the ones who do. This is what's called a negative correlation between the two. And then we might also have some instances of things that simply have no relation between each other. They have no correlation, where the proportions of A's and non-A versions of B are about the same. Like, say, men who drive and women who drive. Uh, drivers and 
men and women don't really have much of a correlation between them. It's pretty evenly mixed between those different groups. So there's no real correlation between men drive between men and people who drive and women and people who drive. Uh, there's no particular patterns there. It's about even. Now, we mention all this because, as I mo said just a moment ago, correlation on its own does not imply that one thing causes another. That is, just because two things go together doesn't mean that the two are related at all. Uh, they could just be entirely a coincidence, or maybe a third thing is the source of both of them, but the two things aren't related on their own. Like, say, um, wearing a cape and being a superhero. It may be that wearing a cape and being a superhero are definitely correlated. Maybe more people who wear capes are superheroes than not. But that doesn't mean that wearing a cape makes you a superhero. Instead, all it does is it means that you tied a piece of cloth around your neck. The two do not magically go together just because most people who are superheroes wear capes or vice versa. Um, however, if there were no association at all, we can say that two things don't cause one another. For example, if there's no positive correlation between things, we can say that one thing does not cause the other. Um, like say, well, uh, the example I've put here on the slide is about coffee drinking and early death. I think this is one out of the textbook. Uh, if we look at coffee drinkers and people who die young, for example, you'll find no correlation at all between these two groups. So we can definitely say that drinking coffee does not cause you to die an early death. If it did, then people who drank coffee and people who died young would have a positive correlation. There would be an association between people who drank coffee and people who died young. Without that sort of association, it seems pretty safe to say that one does not cause the other. Because if it did, the two would go together. Similarly, if there's no negative correlation between two things, we can say that one does not prevent the other. Um, like say, for example, uh, being broke and owning a yacht are negatively correlated. I'm pretty certain. That is, if you're broke, you probably also don't own a yacht. More people who are broke don't have yachts than people who do. Or there are more broke people who don't have yachts than there are broke people that do have yachts. So there's a negative correlation between the two. Uh, but there's probably no such connection between, oh, say, people who own sweaters and people who own yachts. Wearing a sweater isn't going to prevent you in any way from owning a yacht. Uh, in fact, it may even encourage it. So a lack of a negative correlation between those two would mean that there's no prevention there. Uh, so this is one odd instance where we can actually prove a negative by showing that there's no correlation between these between two different things. Uh, so long as there's not an association between two things, we can say pretty confidently that if there's no association, if there's no positive correlation, the one thing doesn't cause the other. And if there's no negative correlation, there's no prevention between the two. So beware of new studies and articles that just talk about links between A and B. Because oftentimes people do confuse these two concepts. Uh, as we mentioned last time, studies, scientific studies, are often very specific when it comes to the conclusions they make. And uh, journalists, because a lot of them are simply looking to get readers for their story, are often not so careful when it comes to the conclusions they make. This isn't to rag on journalism as a profession. This is an unfortunate fact of the market as it exists and the incentives for journalists. So news stories, articles, 
Facebook memes, whatever else, might talk about a link between A and B. And they might talk about an association between them. They might be talking about correlation. But they often use evidence that shows a correlation and say, look, these go together. Therefore, one you know, is connected to the other. One causes the other. We might say that, oh, people who eat chocolate are more likely to live a long time because some study found a positive correlation between people who ate chocolate and people who lived for a long time. But that doesn't mean automatically on its own that eating chocolate makes you live forever or anything like that. Instead, it may simply be the fact that it's a coincidence that eating chocolate and living a long time go together. Or maybe it's some third thing. Maybe people who can afford to eat chocolate can afford medicine to live longer than those who don't. If you're too broke to buy chocolate, you're probably too broke to buy medicine. So you'll probably get sick and die at a younger age. These are the kinds of things that are often blown out of proportion by studies by either ignoring coincidence or ignoring the possibility of some third factor that you know, connects both of the two things. Now, with that word of warning in mind, let's look at a handful of uh, methods of actually doing causal reasoning. And these are based off of the work of a 19th century philosopher named John Stuart Mill. If you're a fan of utilitarianism and ethics, same guy who's well known for it. If you're not, don't worry about it. But John Stuart Mill proposed three different methods for reasoning about cause and effect. And they're not exhaustive and they're not complicated, but they serve as a great foundation for the basics of identifying when one thing causes another. Or how should we go about looking for causes between things? And on the one hand, they seem very intuitive, but being clear about them and how they work and why they work helps us give a good foundation for the concept of a causal argument and for the kinds of things for us to look for when we look for bad causal arguments out in the world. We can learn to be more critical, careful thinkers about the subjects that we care about and that we encounter in the world. So let's take a look at these very briefly. First up is what's called the method of agreement. And this is a way of identifying uh, when something causes something else. Uh, the method of, of agreement says that if an effect occurs in some cases but not in others, that is, if we've got a set of data that has some things where the effect we're looking for is present and some where it's not, that we should start looking for a single factor, call it C, that is present in every instance of the effect. If there's no instance of the effect without C, then we can say with confidence and with good reason that C causes the effect because C is going to be a necessary condition for that effect. So say if we're looking for what makes somebody an astronaut, and so we look at uh, a whole bunch of people who are both astronauts and people who are not astronauts. And in that sample, we notice that every astronaut has been hired by NASA. And there are no instances of somebody being an astronaut who wasn't hired by NASA. So it seems like being hired by NASA is a necessary step for being an astronaut because being hired by NASA is a necessary condition for being a NASA, for being an astronaut. We might even say that being hired by NASA causes you to be an astronaut in some sense. Now I know some of you are already protesting about the various civilian space agencies or, uh, well, I know NASA is civilian, but private space agencies, or you might be talking about other national astronauts. I know, it's an oversimplifi oversimplified example. Bear with me. But method of agreement. You can locate a cause, you can locate a necessary condition type of cause by looking for something that's present along with every single instance of the effect you're looking at. You can identify the cause by finding the thing that's there in every instance of the thing you're talking about. However, this does require a relatively short list of plausible causes. We have to have narrowed down our options already for this to really be plausible as a method of identifying causes. Now, a similar sort of thing, but working in the opposite direction, 
is Mill's method of difference, where we try and find a single factor C, which is absent in all of the cases in which the effect is absent. So say if, um, uh, what's a good one? Let's go with being broke again, because that's unfortunately on a lot of our minds these days. If I want to look for various causes of being broke, and so I look at people who are broke and people who are not broke, people who have money and people who don't. And I notice that in all of the broke people in my sample, none of them have savings accounts. None of them save money. Then it seems fully justified that because in every single instance, there was a lack of savings accounts in all the broke people, that not having a savings account can cause you to be broke. Now, it's not the only way you could be broke, because we're looking at a sufficient condition here, not a necessary one. Remember, sufficient causes or sufficient conditions simply say that this is enough for you to have the desired effect. But it's not necessarily necessary. There are other reasons you might be broke as well. But we might say that if you don't have this one, then it can cause the other. So because this one factor was missing from all of the cases where the effect was missing, we know that it's a sufficient cause. We know that because it's missing in all the instances where the effect's missing, uh, the two go together in some way because they're just linked that tightly. Now, Mill's third method ends up combining these two things called the method of agreement and difference, according, you know, very reasonably. And so here, again, we look at two different types of cases, some where the effect we're looking at is present and some where it's absent. And here we simply try and find something that's consistent. We're trying to look for a single common factor that's present when the effect is present and absent when the effect is absent. You're literally combining the two methods we just talked about. Um, so a good example here. Let's uh, say being an American citizen. If we look at a sample that includes both citizens and non-citizens, and we sit, uh, or let's say voters and non-voters, this will be easier. Uh, if we look at a sample that includes both voters and non-voters, and we notice that every time someone's a voter, they're also an American citizen, and every time they're not a voter, they're not an American citizen, it seems that there's definitely a link between being an American citizen and being a voter. Namely that if you are a voter, you must also be an American citizen. And if the evidence showed that uh, there were no instances where you had one without the other, we might even say that one causes the other, that it's both necessary and sufficient for it. And that's honestly about the gist of Mill's three methods. It's looking for associations between things. Uh, your textbook has a number of different examples that you can run through if you need a little bit more practice with these, or I'd be happy to spend a bit more time with you on them. But Mill's methods overall are limited. They can only help us so much when it comes to doing causal arguments, and they require a substantial amount of background knowledge. In each of these cases, we have to have a relatively short list of plausible causes for the effect we're looking at. Otherwise, there's simply too much information for us to really be able to process. So in very complex cases or in things that we or in the case of things that we don't understand very well, Mill's methods are just a little bit too simple. They're a little bit too basic for identifying when one thing is a cause or when we're trying to establish some kind of a causal relationship between two different things, when we're trying to make causal arguments. So we might also use another key type of causal argument, something called inference to the best explanation, or abduction. Not abduction in the sense of kidnapping, but 
in the sense of reasoning away from something. Now, inference to the best, best explanation is a type of inductive argument that states that some hypothesis H, say, is the best explanation for some set of facts or data. Therefore, because it's the best explanation for the data, H is probably true. This is the kind of reasoning that you see a lot in medical diagnoses or in crime solving stuff. In fact, it's the sort of thing that Sherlock Holmes is actually most famous for. He claims that he's using deduction. You know, he praises his powers of deduction to Watson and each, each of the different case files and whatnot. Sherlock Holmes actually almost always used inference to the best explanation. He looked at a set of observations and reasoned that a certain thing was the best explanation for all of that data. And therefore, most likely, it was true. Now, inference to the best explanation, like all types of inductive arguments, is not deductively val valid. It assumes that the best explanation, that is, the most explanatorily useful explanation, is the true explanation for what's going on, which is an assumption that ain't necessarily so. It doesn't guarantee that the conclusion is true. So we should not mistake inference of the best explanation for a type of deductive argument. We're still doing induction. We're still doing arguments that don't guarantee that our conclusions are true. But it is still an argument that gives us good reason to think that the conclusion is true. Namely, that because it is the best fit for the data we can find, it's probably true. We have good reason to think that it's true. Now, when we start talking about things that is the best explanation for a set of data, it's worth talking about for a moment what it takes to actually be the best explanation. And we might say that an explanation is a candidate for being one of the best if it fits a couple of different conditions. For one, the explanation has to be plausible for obvious reasons. If you have a truly ridiculous explanation, it's probably not the best one available. So you're going to be needing explanations that are plausible for the kind of thing that we're looking at. An explanation also has to actually fit the evidence and background knowledge that we have better than other explanations. That is, we might say that it has more explanatory power. That it is, it has the ability to actually fit and explain why each of the different pieces of data are actually there and present. And it can accommodate uh, more of them or all of them. I should say all or at least more than other competing explanations. And lastly, the explanation should also be falsifiable. That is, it should rule out a few different kinds of things. There should be some kind of evidence that can prove your hypothesis wrong. And this is important for us to actually have good attempts at explanation, good hypotheses. It's something that's necessary for good science. If it isn't quite clear, let's look at an example or two. Uh, let's consider you know, something like crime solving, or if we want to be a little bit less morbid, let's even just take medical diagnosis, since that's another very straightforward and simple sort of example of this type of reasoning. Let's suppose that you go into the doctor, and you're coughing and sneezing, and you have a runny nose, and you have a very mild fever. Now, our first instinct might, to say, might be to say, oh, well, you have a cold. And that seems very reasonable because it seems to be one of the best explanations available. You know, it could be many different things. You could have the flu. You could be dying of some rare type of cancer. You could have invisible spirits that are plaguing the inside of your sinus cavities and cursing you with misery. But the fact that you have a cold seems to be the best explanation out of those options. For one, it's plausible. The idea that you have invisible spirits cursing the inside of your sinus cavity is not a very plausible explanation. That doesn't happen a whole lot, especially not these days. Furthermore, the fact that you have a cold or the hypothesis that you have a cold fits the evidence and the background knowledge that we have much better than the other options. 
for one, it accommodates all the different symptoms. So it fits all the data that we have. And it also fits with what we know about people and runny noses and coughs and mild fevers and all that sort of thing. Uh, we know that most people that have these aren't dying of some rare cancer and don't need an exorcist for the inside of their nose. Uh, we just simply have background knowledge that's not necessarily part of the case, but that we know about other things in general about the topic. We know that you having a cold fits that information far better than the cursed sinus cavity hypothesis. And furthermore, whether or not you have a cold can be proven false. Uh, if you do have a cold, then blood work might show a certain virus in, uh, or a sample of your mucus might show that there is a rhinovirus inside your body right now. Whereas there's not really a test that can prove the haunted sinus cavity theory wrong. No matter what you come up with, you can probably have some kind of bullshit explanation for why there are still spirits cursing the inside of your head. So again, having a cold is a far better explanation than the others. It fits our background knowledge better, so in that it's more likely than the others, it's more plausible, and it accommodates all of the different symptoms. If I tried to propose instead that, say, um, you have a broken foot, you come in with a runny nose, a cough, a headache, mild fever, and I tell you that you have a broken foot, you're going to look at me very strangely because that doesn't fit any of the evidence. It's not a good explanation for the stuff that's going on. So inference of the best explanation is just the very ordinary reasoning of attempting to find the best fitting hypothesis for a given set of data and given our background knowledge and given a couple of other minor conditions. Now, being familiar with those, let's go over a handful of the basic mistakes that somebody can make when talking about this stuff, because these are things we need to watch out for if we want to do this stuff well. First off is what's called the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy, or more commonly the post hoc fall fallacy. This little bit of Latin literally means after this, therefore because of this. And this is a fallacy of people who simply confuse correlation and causation. The post hoc fallacy says that, well, because one thing happened after another one, these two must be connected. There's a famous Simpsons clip that I believe I've posted on Blackboard, if I remember, uh, where Lisa is demonstrating this type of reasoning to her idiot father, Homer, and basically says, well, like, that's bad reasoning. Like, look, I can say this rock prevents tiger attacks because look, so long as I've had this rock, there have been no tiger attacks because I've picked up this rock. Nobody's ever attacked. That's just bad reasoning. If you go out every morning and yell, may this house be protected from tigers or something in Latin, and then no tigers attack afterwards, that doesn't mean that you're crappy incantation every morning actually prevents tiger attacks. Uh, another example of this kind of reasoning that's used is more seriously used, like in the case of the concept of a gateway drug. Uh, there are such things as gateway drugs, you know, drugs that say lead to a higher instance of use of some other drug. Uh, one of the more insidious examples at the moment are prescription opioids and heroin use. A lot of people who begin taking prescription opioids eventually end up taking heroin instead when the prescription runs out, but they're now addicted to the chemical contents of those pills. A bad example of this, though, shows up in some of the scare tactics drug education stuff that's been you know, presented to children for a while. I only bring this up not because of any political opinions, which I'm officially neutral on all topics for, but simply because I find it kind of amusing. It's often cited that marijuana is a gateway drug for harder stuff like heroin or crack or whatever else. And some statistic might be pulled out that, oh, some 
80% of people who take heroin first smoked marijuana. And so because they smoked marijuana first, that must cause you to go to heroin is the way the reasoning is supposed to work. Except that it ain't necessarily so. For example, some 95% of those heroin users drank milk before they ever took heroin. And so we might say that on the same type of reasoning that milk is a gateway drug for heroin, which obviously makes no sense at all. Just because two things happen in sequence or are even associated with each other doesn't mean that one causes the other. It's an example of confusing correlation and cause. Just because things go together doesn't mean that one causes the other. Uh, it might be a coincidence. There might be some extra thing, some third hidden cause that produces both A and B, and that's why they show up together. But it doesn't mean that A and B actually are associated with each other. And so to avoid this sort of thing, we need to actually rule out other explanations or at least consider other possibilities. Excuse me. Another sort of mistake that happens is what's called the fallacy of objectionable cause or the fallacy of false cause. And this fallacy concludes that there is a causal relationship between A and B on the basis of far, far too little evidence. This is similar to a kind of hasty generalization. It's simply being too quick to reach a conclusion. This is the sort of thing that happens when two people say that, well, A and B could be related because there's a few instances of them going together. Therefore, A causes B. It's the sort of thing that just simply doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you actually spell it out. But it's unfortunately common in political discussions. It's the sort of thing that crops up where, oh, well, if you believe, you know, it's possible that if you believe in this, then you also therefore believe in this other horrible thing. And that's just not simply the case in a lot of instances. Just because things could go together doesn't mean that they actually do go together. Um, so yeah, in this case, it's simply an example of hasty generalization that is reasoning on too little evidence, but for causal arguments, saying that because there's the smallest hint these two things could be connected, there, and then saying, therefore, they actually are. Now, we might also worry about begging the question when it comes to causal arguments. And this is the same as begging the question in general, where we assume some kind of relationship to be established. This is the kind of thing that you unfortunately see all too often in students complaining about their grades. Not saying that any of you do this. Thankfully, you all have been a great group this semester. But say, you probably all know somebody who's claimed that a teacher has hated you, or maybe at some point you've been this person. And if you were to ask why, you might get the following sort of argument. You're like, oh, look, this teacher absolutely hates me. He gave me a bad grade because he hates me. But how do you know he hates you? Well, look at all the Fs he gave me. Look at all the bad grades that he gave me. In this case, the evidence and the conclusion are pretty much the same thing. The conclusion's been built right into the evidence you're citing for the conclusion. If you're looking and trying to establish that the teacher hating you caused the bad grades, don't cite the bad grades as evidence for the teacher hating you. You've got the order of explanation backwards. You're assuming your conclusion right there in your premises, and it's, it's simply unjustified. Another very common causal argument that people make that is absolutely terrible and fallacious and badly justified is what's called the slippery slope fallacy. Or if we want to be specific, in our instance, a causal slippery slope fallacy. And this is the kind of argument that says that some thing A has a chain of effects which eventually leads to some kind of disaster and should therefore be avoided. It's not specifically a causal argument per se, because the conclusion is not A causes B. Instead, it uses a causal argument as part of its evidence. And in particular, it's a kind of reductio argument. It's a kind of reductio ad absurdum. 
That is, it tries to say you should avoid A because it leads to all these terrible things. And because it leads to all these terrible things, you should therefore avoid it. The problem with the causal version of this argument is that usually it assumes, fallaciously assumes, that one thing necessarily or inevitably causes another thing. Where the analogy is that you're sliding down a slippery slope. If you start going down this path, necessarily, you're going to slip all the way down the slope and fall to the bottom. This is the sort of thing that crops up, um, for example, with arguments like uh, one fairly contemporary political analogy is that of, of one against LGBT marriage and that sort of thing. If we, if we legalize gay marriage, then you're going to end up with a society that legalizes uh, polygamy and bestiality and necrophilia, and then the whole society is just going to come crumbling down. Therefore, we can't legalize gay marriage. Well, that kind of argument is fallacious. It's mistaken. Just because one thing is legalized doesn't mean that the other ones will be legalized. It doesn't mean that legalizing gay marriage is going to cause society to legalize bestiality or necrophilia or whatever else. Even if there were an association between the things, you know, we might simply cite again the idea that it ain't necessarily so. This one thing does not cause the others. Uh, slippery slope arguments generally assume that if we start this chain of events, it will inevitably lead to a terrible conclusion. And that's just simply almost always unjustified. If there is going to be such a causal chain, it needs to have additional evidence that shows that these things are all sufficient conditions for each other. And almost always, this simply doesn't happen. So slippery slope arguments often just are mistaken. They're fallacious in a variety of different ways. And that about covers it. Uh, so that wraps up our discussion of causal arguments. Next time we'll dig a little bit more into more types of inductive arguments with next unit. We'll start looking at arguments by analogy, when they're acceptable and when they're not, what it takes to have a good argument by analogy. In the meantime, though, there's still a little bit of work to do for this unit. So take a look at the homework if you haven't already. Take a look at the journal. Don't forget it. Usual stuff. Let me know if you have any questions, and as always,